Hello. I love it when they sit me so far away from my old <laughs> panel. It's like, why? What did I do to deserve Come it? Over. <laughs> I know. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. This is such an amazing audience for such an important topic. My name is Anita Osmond Britton. I am a startup life reporter at Sifted. Um, I also am a small time investor, a consultant, and I write about sex in the South Asian diaspora with my company, Brown Bodies a whole wide range of things. But the thing that has kind of been my, my connector through everything is this belief that we need a workforce that represents our society and we need everyone at the table to build a future where we are all served and represented, which is why we are here today. If you're here in the audience, I am going to presume that we don't need to tell you why it's important that diversity and inclusion exist. We've heard this topic being banged on about for years. How many of you have been to a panel before about diversity and inclusion? How many of you are so bored of this topic, but you just want it solved? <laughs> right, it's really, really frustrating. So we're not here to tell you why this is important. We're here to tell you what we can do about it, what is missing, and why the hell the needle hasn't moved yet. So I'd love to introduce you to my wonderful panel. Thank you, Anisha. And thank you, everyone. It's super exciting to see so many women here. I look like we have them all here in this room. I'm Silvina Moschini. I have a dual role as an entrepreneur. I'm the founder, chairwoman, and president of Unicoin, a tech-regulated cryptocurrency that is backed by real assets, including equity stakes in high-growth companies, and Unicorn Hunters, a platform that allows for investors from all over the world to invest in entrepreneurs. Hi everyone, awesome to be here and to feel the energy. My name is Tara Shuklovsky. I'm the founder and CEO of Technovation. It's the l largest technology entrepreneurship program for girls. We run in 120 countries, and now we are partnering with UNICEF to empower 25 million young women tech entrepreneurs um, over the next 10 years. Hi everyone, really pleased to be here as well. Um, I'm Clara Chapez, I'm the director of La French Tech. What is La French Tech? We're the administration part of the Ministry of Economy in France, uh, aiming at supporting the growth of startups. And one key topic we've been focused on for, for quite a long time, as you said, um, is obviously diversity and inclusion in the place of women in this ecosystem. And though I'm pleased to see so many women here, I still have the same question. Where are the men? We're not going to solve this by our own. Awesome. <laughs> Thank you for being here, the few of you. <laughs> and I think this is a really important point, which is what we're going to kick off with, is often when we have these conversations, the people who are affected most tend to be the people in the room, yet we need everyone as part of the conversation. So we're focusing this DEI conversation specifically on the intersectionality of women. So let's contextualize that a little bit. What is it we're saying when we're saying women are still not represented, women are still not equal, women are still not funded? Let's start with the French tech. So taking France as an example, but honestly, we, we have a, an NGO called SISTA. We run a study at European level, and truth is we're all the same, and we're all as bad. Um, when you talk about tech and women, the, the data is horrendous. It's uh, less than 30% of women work um, in tech, and the upper you go, the less women you see. So it's like when you look at management position, it's close to 20%. And when mm -hmm. you look at funders, um, it's less than 10% of startups that have been funded by female teams, which makes no sense. I mean, when you talk about women, you only talk about half the population. Why on earth is this not represented in tech? And, and a lot of people we're talking with are like, oh, yeah, I, I get it. I want to solve that. It's not all more. But I think the, the, the key topic here is a lot of people are addressing the issue thinking we have to do it for some kind of societal issues because it's equality. Uh, I mean, I don't think anyone can stand and say, oh, I'm against equality, uh, thankfully. But, but I think we're looking at it in the wrong uh, sense because it's not just a question of, of, of society and the society we want to build. It's a question of opportunities and performance. Mm -hmm. and, and, and if we, Europe, want to be the most innovative we can be and, and support this startup ecosystem, which has grown so much over the last 10 years, we need women fully in. And that's, I think, something that um, we're really fighting for uh, with French Tech. We'll come back to policy in a minute, because I think that's such an important part of the conversation. Sarah. 
Um, I think, like everybody said, we're kind of bored of the, <laughs> the <laughs> there's a problem. Um, I think there's a problem. I think the, the data is kind of interesting. I'm curious if anyone wants to make a guess at how many women in technology, women professionals in technology there are in the world. Do you think it's in the millions, in the hundred millions, <laughs> in the tens of millions? You can shout out. Hundreds of millions, people are saying. Hundred, some people say hundreds of millions. Well, the, there are only 11 million men in technology and only 3 million women who are wow. technology professionals. So if you think about how much progress the world is making through technology and the number of, of people who are data scientists, machine learning experts, it's minuscule. So it's not just that there are not enough men, women, there are not even that many men as well. And most of um, the people actually come from North America and Europe. Um, and some from India and, and, and China. So most of the world is not represented in these statistics. And I think um, I am more interested in sort of the pipeline and systemic issues that are driving it because I've been running Technovation for 20 years and I'm really tired of this topic. Um, <laughs> and so I think there's a lot that we know about what can be done to, be, to fix it. Um, and I'm more interested in talking about that. Great. So Vina, you have a slightly different view. You're also working in a very deep tech space, you're working in the crypto, so what is the context for you to this conversation? Well, Anisha, I like Shakira. <laughs> <laughs> That's I don't know I thought this was if going. you guys know her, but she, she thinks that making money is better than crying, so I will not cry, I will just share the perspective of how we can make money so we can build companies that actually make a difference. And there are two different conversations. One is about getting women in technology, and in my case, I have a master's degree in communications and a career in public relations. And I lead a cryptocurrency, a $12 billion crypto company, and a show. And I never studied technology, but I lead a technology company. So that's also one thing that we need to think on, how women can lead technology companies without having to be technology experts, because you have to be a good leader. The other thing is how we get more money invested in women, because we are half the sky, but only 2% of the venture capitalist money go to women. So perhaps as women, we need to think what are the issues that we have related to women, power, and money. So we can change not only the conversation, because we are all sick and tired of having this conversation, but actually getting funded. How do we get the money that we need to make our companies succeed? And there are many things, we can discuss that later, but there are many different things that thinking differently, which is something that we all know that women can do. We can skirt the rules without bending, just, we are breaking them, just bending them to get things done and get the access to capital that we need. So you see, they've laid this out perfectly for me. We've got the structure on the pipeline, we've got the policy, and we've got the investment. So let's start at the structure on the pipeline. Can you explain to me, we had a wonderful conversation earlier on today about what we're seeing in terms of what already does work. And we're so focused on this one tiny bit, but you see a much wider reasoning for why there is still this issue in tech. Could you outline this for me? I believe you said there are five reasons. Yeah, so um, there are five factors that go into um, driving systemic change. And I think one of the challenges with why we are still having this problem is that we look for one solution. And um, there's no country in the world where we have gender equality. And there are 150 countries in the world that legally discriminate against women. So it's not just that women need more funding, there are multiple things that need to be fixed. And so number one, um, they need more role models and that's where things like entertainment and media and books and um, panels like this and conferences like this can be awesome. Um, number two, you need tremendous amount of training because social stereotypes are so strong where girls are just directed into careers that are socially acceptable. Um, so even like in Africa, um, women run more than 50% of the businesses, but most of the businesses are um, in very low growth, um, highly competitive, uh, socially accepted, um, and very low tech. So these businesses are what women are supposed to go into. Um, number three, you need a whole ecosystem of cheerleaders. So 
your partner, your parents, your mentor needs to be supporting you because guess what? For centuries they have not. Mm -hmm. um, so you cannot s sort of sidestep that. And lastly, you need incredible ecosystems like this that you come regularly to to get refueled, recharged, and celebrated. Because without that, um, being an entrepreneur is incredibly difficult. And you need to be connected to others like you to help you along your journey. Clara, I like that point that Tara made about, <laughs> see we've got a rhyming panel, um, about pipeline and education. And the French ecosystem has put a lot of emphasis on tech education. There's quite a lot of programs as Ecole uh, 42. What sort of things are you seeing and are you seeing an improvement because of those programs that are being put in place? Yeah, I think as you say, Tara, um, it, it's very hard to solve the problem if you only look at one aspect of the multiple reasons we're here. So obviously, um, what, what has been uh, pushed in France for, for a few years now is, is trying to address all of those things. Um, the gender equality was uh, named the, the biggest cause for the country uh, at the first, on the first time our president was elected uh, uh, back seven years ago now. And, and since then, um, how we thought we would address is a combination of regulation and everything that goes beyond regulation, because it can not only be regulation, but it can not only be support actions. Um, some of the laws that we have in France that I think are, are, have really proven um, things can move is everything to do with quotas. Um, so of course, uh, everyone would love a world where you don't have to impose a central number of uh, women on boards or on uh, executive committees and all of that. But truth is, if you don't do that, then you don't have the focus you need so that everyone contributes to achieve those numbers. So that was kind of the, the mindset, um, looking first at boards more than 10 years ago, 2011, uh, having 40% women on boards for big companies in France. Looking then, 2021, at executive committees, having also achieving 40% women on executive committees for big companies. Um, and, and then you take this approach, and then it allows you to get everyone involved, because I agree with you, it takes a village, to see how do we reach those numbers. Um, and, and I think one of the, the things I've noticed a lot is there's a bit this idea or, or, or this fear that, yeah, okay, we have this ambition, we know where we want to go, but everyone's talking about, about it and nothing moves. And that's where we have tried to come in with French Tech, is by bringing everyone on the table and, and, and starting thinking what can everyone do at their own level. I'm going to take a very concrete example. We have this big uh, ranking called the Next 40. It's the top 40 companies in tech in France. Truth is, when you look at the CEOs, only one woman. So obviously the media did what they had to do and say, hey, like what's going on in France? Like even the, the old school like corporate companies have more women CEOs. And so with the French tech mission, what we try to do is say, okay, how do we solve that? So I started calling the CEOs and be like, hey, we have this issue. I know it's not something you, you, you're happy to promote. How do we work together? And the first conversations I had with the CEOs was like, Oh, but like, I'm a man, like, I, I, I do understand, I do want to make an impact, I do want to make things move, but like, probably I'm going to send you some women to participate in your working groups because they will know better. And that's why I ask how many men we have in the room because everyone can have an impact and everyone needs to have an impact. And it's only when the CEO, who's a male, starts to say, okay, yeah, we have the laws, we have the quotas, we have all of this, but I want to change the culture of my companies that we see things changing. It's the most stuff like the CEO is going to put in his agenda, in his calendar, oh, um, two times a week at 5 p.m., I'm leaving and go uh, pick my, my kids up at school or at nursery. Guess what? This CEO said, okay, once I started doing that, the culture actually changed. And it's not because you're going to say things are going to change, that things are going to change. You need everyone to act. And that's what we're trying to promote is bringing everyone together, regulation, of course, but also corporates, also NGOs, also everyone, so that we combine the efforts. So from an individual level, say there's someone here who doesn't live in a country where there are quotas on boards, or they're working in policy, or they're in the C-suite, what would you say to them in terms of what they can do to encourage those people at the top to be like, we do potentially need a quota, or we do need the CEO to make this move without there being regulation. What can people practically do? 
So what we looked at with uh, Parity Pact, we, we basically all worked on very concrete solutions, and then we has, asked companies, hey, do you want to commit mm. um, to, to implement this? So not regulation, but like concrete steps on things that can make a difference. Five things came out. Um, so not talking about the pipeline, but talking really in the company, what can I do differently? First thing is training. Because we all have gender biases. I mean, I'm the first one where I'm in a room surrounded by male. It's probably a board meeting or an important executive committee. What do I do? I stand up and I ask, should I get you coffee? Why? <laughs> Why have I, have I ingrained this type of behavior in myself so much that I'm the one doing that? So training, making sure we understand all those biases and how they, they act on the way you behave. Then it's um, role models, making sure that people who represent the sector are women like we are today, but also male, and we have a, a balanced perspective. Um, all, obviously, the, the, um, uh, all the process around having children, because one of the data that I think is, is the most horrendous is even though some tech companies do manage to attract women, after 35 years old, one out of two of those women actually leave tech. Mm -hmm. Because it's very uh, exhausting, it's fast moving, so how companies can really work around this and re-onboard people after their parental leave, making sure that this is addressed. And then obviously having big commitments on, on boards, on executive committees, this is something that in uh, any case, if companies don't want to do it, they're going to have to do it in France. Sabine, I want to ask you as a founder, how does this kind of impact you? You're working on this kind of day to day and you're saying that earlier on that there's an issue with investment. So where do you see that issue being? Do you think it's the government's role? Do you think it's your investors' role to support you? Or is it your role to be like, I'm the person who's going to change this industry? I think the government can support uh, to drive some policies that facilitate the acceleration of change. But it's also our own responsibility as women uh, since that worked for me, the many times that when I was asking for money, they gave me advice, and when I asked for advice, they didn't give me money, was to truly convince myself that I was deserving that. So a big chunk of this work is related to the work that we need to do on ourselves to stop apologizing, because women many times apologize and take an approach that is extremely conservative. Isn't that because we've been told and socialized? Exactly, to? because like in Mexico, if someone speaks Spanish, you'll know like calladita, calladita, que te ves bien bonita, like stay still, that you look prettier like that. There is a social expectation that we will not be strong, that we will not be driven, that will not be assertive, because you end up being like the crazy bitch on the room if you are assertive and you ask for, for money. So I think that we need to work on that. And something that it worked for me a lot was to find sponsors. And it's quite different from a mentor, because mentors, it's a word that is just like so overrated. Everybody pretends to be a mentor or want to be a mentor. But when you really sponsor someone, you lift them up. You took care of this person. You introduce this, say, this is my girl. So you give them money, because I vouch for her. And in my case, it was game changing, and it was just a matter of asking. I asked a former chief of state, the president of Costa Rica, if she could help me out by joining the board of my company to train women on skills for employability in a past company that I have. I asked the former treasurer of the United States, Rosy Rios, another woman that has been through the same challenges that many of you have gone through, to be part of my board and join me in my investment show. And Asking these women to join me helped me enormously so I could bridge this credibility gap. So by pegging yourself into some women that can be instrumental to opening doors is something that is very important. And the other thing is to think that this is a problem of women. Like, based on the amount of women that I see here, it's like we think that either men don't care or men don't actually care. And this is not about women, this is about diversity, the diversity of point of views. Because we represent half the sky, today women have like 57% of the university and advanced degrees, yet we are all women talking about the need to have representation, which is absurd. So get yourself a co-founder and work it out. <laughs> because when you build yourself diverse teams, you are winning. But many times we women ended up like 
getting together with more women and talking about the problems that we women have instead of actually building diverse ourselves to break the stereotype that we have a big chance at being responsible for creating. So that's, so that's the individual contributor. That's you and your role in how to change it. How about your investors? What are we saying to investors? Why is it that there is still this issue in the funding gap? We've also seen we've had the pandemic. We've had an economic downturn. We've had all of these reasons why VCs are starting to tighten in purse strings. And on one side, we see that, hey, look, all these founders that are women are surviving by bootstrapping, by like mm -hmm. really doing it on their own, yet they're losing the most investment on the other side. So what is that disparity where we're seeing women do more with less, yet not being able to raise money? Do you want to maybe take that, Tara, as a start? Um, I don't know if, if I can answer that, right? Um, I think being an entrepreneur, but in the social sector, one thing, and because we have supported so many young women to start businesses, one thing that I have seen is that um, passion, and if you pick the right problem um, that is big enough, it'll motivate you to move mountains, and your passion will move the funder. Um, and I think that maybe my that has been an approach that I have found. I think too often we think entrepreneurs are great. Whatever an entrepreneur wants to do is great. It needs to be funded. But I would I would think that. You have to think very, very carefully, like why do 90% of startups fail? Because you didn't spend enough time picking the right problem. And picking the right problem is incredibly difficult. And I think that this could be a way where women uh, who are entering the entrepreneurship space now could actually learn from the past mistakes and instead of trying to go down um, a, a very beaten path, um, try to sort of figure out like, okay, you want to start an AI company, what are the really big problems that need to be tackled where you can make a huge difference? And I think that instead of being called assertive, um, I found that um, passion can be a very, very, very powerful motivator for any funder. Um, and so I would, I would take it from the other angle. The flip side of that question then, if we're maybe saying that women aren't building companies that of maybe VC fundable, which maybe is not quite what you're saying, but are we saying there are maybe alternative models of capital for them that they should be raising? Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's a great test of your idea, right? Like, um, will people be willing to pay for it? Um, I've been studying some women-led companies in uh, low-income countries. I learned about the largest motorcycle hailing platform in Indonesia led by a woman. I learned about the largest pharmaceutical matching platform in Egypt led by a woman. And these are all immediate like technology solutions that are providing value um, to the user and give you freedom. Like you don't need VC investment. So I feel like there are some more ways to, to go about building your dream. And Clara, I know we've spoken about this before and our French Tech talks about it a lot. Like this idea of being over mentored and underfunded and we now have this women's mentoring hour across Europe, which loads of VCs got involved in. How do we actually change the needle, though, to get them to put that check in to those women? Yeah, I, 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 will, agree, I, I will allow myself to, to disagree slightly with what's been said. I, I don't think it's a question of what projects women are building. I think it's a question of biases that investors have. I mean, the truth is, when you're selling your project to a room that is full of men, because we talked about the number of women in startups, but if you look at the number of women in VCs, it's worse. Like you have close to no GPs that are women, that's the truth. And obviously it comes with biases. Um, because the way you assess an idea, a business, a personality, is also based on who you are. So if you're male assessing a woman's idea, a woman's way of selling this idea, you're gonna have biases. And, and I think I like what you said earlier about once you've done, when, once you've come to that conclusion, you can either cry or you can make money. And what we're seeing in France is um, a first generation of funds that are going after women funded companies only. Uh, Sista is an NGO that has been doing a lot around financing and women, and they started their fund called the Sista Fund. And truth is, when you talk about their funder, Tatiana, she said, I'm getting access to all the amazing deals I could, I, I could have. Because I'm the only fund positioned towards women 
And, and the deal flow I have is simply extraordinary just because I'm here. And I think there's an opportunity for VCs to do things a bit differently and maybe to go after this topic and think, okay, you know what, nobody's going there, guess what, there's an opportunity. And if we see more and more VCs getting in there, I think it will also help more and more uh, female uh, founders getting funded. So really encouraging this as a source of, of bridging this gap, maybe just changing the way finance uh, and, and VC works and getting more and more VCs just looking at this opportunity as an opportunity, not as social good. Do we run the risk, though, if we're saying there are investors who invest solely in women, investors who invest solely in black people, investors who invest solely in LGBTQ+, of the wider investment industry being like, those are the people for you, you should go and invest in them, and it gives them an excuse to be like, I can carry on investing in the same old, same old, the, the standard meritocracy vibe, the Mark Zuckerbergs of the future. Is it just an excuse to palm interesting founders off? I do agree that's a risk, but you know what, I think when those funds, they show much better returns than the so-called generalist funds, guess what's gonna happen? I'm pretty sure the funds that are investing in the traditional non-diverse will eye on diversity and say, hey, you know what, there's a business opportunity and they will change. So, you know, what do you think? I agree with Claire. And I think that there are also different opportunities that we need to look at as women when we seek for funding because we've been trained to look at the VCs. And we know that the VCs will not give us the money that we need. In my experience, and I, I, I did crowd financing at a global scale, and I raised $50 million, and I took my company to a billion dollar valuation using crowd financing, allowing people from around the world to take a chance on me because the chance that I have to find people who will understand what I was doing was a lot larger than going, even living in Silicon Valley, knocking on the doors of the VCs who were telling me, oh, I love what you're doing. You have the right traction. You are at the right moment. I said, okay, will you give me the money? And they say, oh, you are too early. I say, no, I was at the right time. So when you think of different uh, avenues in which you can get financing, crowd financing is an opportunity for women because it opens up the chance for other women to invest in you with a smaller ticket and one ticket after the other ticket, it adds up. And then you have a massive network of ambassadors who have a skin in the game in your company. So I think that we also need to think that there are different avenues aside from the VCs. And the other thing is like, I'm scouting companies all the time. And I, can you I cannot tell you enough how hard it is to find companies run by women that are scalable enough to be investable. And it breaks my heart because I take a gender-less approach. I invest in good entrepreneurs, but I get extra excited when I find a woman who is an, an, an entrepreneur because I know what it takes. And I know that if we are there, we are there for a reason. We are way more committed because we have it three times at least harder, but it's very difficult for women to think in billion dollar companies versus to think on a sub company with a short shape of lemons. So if they don't have the growth men mentality, the growth mindset, investors will not give us the money because they wanna see the returns. They care about the purpose, but that's for pocket money, for the funds that invest in some cases just for social impact, which is absolutely it's stupid that you think that social impact is not a good business, but in reality, when you take the diversity or the social impact approach, you're more likely to get a smaller funds and a smaller money, and they will have like a lot more expectations from you because they feel that they are asking you for a favor. They're giving you a favor. They're doing a favor to you. So in the interest of taking up space, like we always do, we're gonna go over by a minute and quickly, one line for people who are here, what can they do for you to support you right now? Maybe. I will say sign up to be a Technovation mentor. If you have a daughter, um, the reality is that she will get paid 40% less than a man of her same qualification, and your granddaughter will be paid 40% less than a male of her uh, qualification. So unless we do something today, that will not change. And the fastest way and the most effective way to do is to mentor a girl to become a technology entrepreneur because this Thank is a you. muscle. Serena. <laughs> if you have a daughter, teach them that gender is, that talent has no gender. If you are 
uh, an investor or a woman who has some money invest in women-led companies. If you are an entrepreneur, think big or go home. <laughs> Clara, finish yourself. Um, we're very proud to have 30 female CEOs from the French tech communities gathered here, thanks to Numeum, Pamet Numérique, and uh, the Chambre de Commerce. They are here to spend their time on Web Summit, and if any of you in the room can find the time to meet and discuss business opportunities, I'm sure a lot of things will happen um, that are really positive for, for the ecosystem. Sarah, Sarah, Sabina, thank you so much.